researching on Carol Reed at the British Film Institute, I, I, I uh, looked at his papers, which are kept uh, in the special collection at the uh, at the BFI, and um, came across a, a letter from Orson Welles. I can't remember the exact words, but it's something like this: "Dear Carol, um, how how disappointing uh, it is that you, you you didn't keep your promise, which is that." Um, when you were casting for um, Outcast of the Islands, you didn't, um, as you said you would, use me in, in the title role. You must realize how this has uh, completely affected my finances for Othello. And um, of course, I, I, I don't blame you, he says. Um, it's that fellow Corder. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, he says, and he ends up by saying, uh, my feelings for you are little short of idolatry, um, yours ever. Orson Welles. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Can we see Orson Welles as um, as Willems? Um, I don't think so. No. I mean, he's too well fit, isn't yes, he? Yes. And, and uh, it's that gaunt, uh, uh, curled look of of of, of uh, being on the edge and sort of falling over, which uh, which uh, is cul is is there yes. uh, potential in um, I think a marvelous film. It's obviously got a very very difficult task because if anyone one knows the the Conrad novel, this was the second novel that Conrad ever wrote before he really decided that he was going to be a full time writer, and um, it is. Um, a marvellous novel, but it's very static and in, in, internalised and sort of very, very long descriptions and a very complex psychologically. And that was a test of the kind of things Charles was saying about Reed's ability to kind of give you just through the visuals rather than the words, which is extreme in this film, because um, the part played by Karima, Aisa, the, the, the woman, um, does talk quite a lot in the film, and you, you have entry to her thoughts, and she talks a lot, whereas here, um, you know, there's no communication between them. No, she's mute, she? yes. yes. Many of Reed's films are about father-son relationships, and although Lingard isn't um, the natural father of Willems, mm. in a sense he is his surrogate father, who has been rescuing him mm. time and time again. And without wanting to, again, to um, be too direct about this, or wanting to psychopathologize um, the films, it's clear that when one thinks about um, Reed's illegitimate background, being the illegitimate son of um, Herbert Beerbohm Tree, that the, the father-son relationship um, can be read in, in those terms. The, the father-son relationship, not only in this film, but in many other films of, of, um, of Reed's. And the other thing to say is that um, many of Reed's films are set in exotic, have exotic settings, don't they, or foreign settings. We've seen Vienna, as you've said, Berlin, uh, Havana, and, and so on. Carol Reed collaborated with Graham Greene on, on three occasions, but before the collaboration in, in, in this direct way on, on the three films, The Fallen Idol, The Third Man, and in 1957, 8, um, Our Man in Havana, Graham Greene had um, um, written eulogistically about, um, about Carol Reed's films. Somebody he, he had admired and had placed above Alfred Hitchcock. Green had a sort of curious uh, fetish about, against Alfred Hitchcock and, and thought that Reed was a much, much better director. And in fact, when, um, when the, the rights were up for Our Man in Havana, he was determined that Hitchcock couldn't get his hands on, on them to make the film because Hitchcock was interested in making Our Man in Havana and, and eventually um, uh, Reed got the green light. So we're talking here really, I think, about one of the great partnerships of the, um, of the literary and, and film world in, in the history of British English literature and, and, and filmmaking. The partnership between Reed and Green was um, vital. It obviously shared an affinity. I mean, you can see that just from the fact that um, Green was writing so enthusiastically about um, Reed's films, you know, even, even in those difficult years of the 1930s. Reed had come into to, to a stage of his career when, if you like, all the winds were blowing in the right direction for him. He was a very successful director um, who had the backing of the film in industry. He had actor Alexander Corder behind him. He had a good relationship with Corder as well as Green. And um, all the circumstances came right for, for him. Um, and that scene in the big wheel, of course, there's Vienna we see through the window. And I think so the, the, there's such an important quality in filmmaking which um, Reed was perhaps better able to harness than other directors, which is luck and serendipity and this ability to respond to an environment. And in Vienna, he had this, this, um, the four, um, this, 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 this extraordinary place which um, 
what was again a, a very important catalyst. So I think all these different elements came together. You can't really say it was Reed and Green that was the most important element, or it was Sir, Sir Alexander Corder. I mean, I think it, in his own way, David Selznick, who right the way through the Third Man was a very, very difficult presence, making things very difficult, was just as important. Mm. And that tension, I think, often you need things to be difficult. You need to have lim limitations in order to, um, it's the grist which makes the, the, the pearl, if you like. And I think all these things came together in that film. Well, what do you say about serendipity? I mean, in, in, in your book, you go into considerable detail about, you know, the, all, the original um, plans for the cast and, you know, the idea that, um, until quite late on, um, Cary Grant was the favourite, wasn't he, for him actually read the, the script and wavered and havered about it. But, um, you know, in the end, um, and obviously this is partly what Reed makes of it, but the, 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 the luck is that Joseph Cotton plays a part which he's wonderfully attuned to, and can one imagine um, Noel Coward, marvellous though he is, in, in, in um, Our Men in Havana, playing Harry Lyme. I mean, no, I, I think it was an organic process, yes. and somehow, but you needed someone who could, could marshal that process, and, and, yes, and, and yes. Reed did it um, sublimely. Green um, and, and, and Reed have this interest, this mutual interest, didn't they, in, in thematically in questions of innocence and guilt, mm. didn't they, and the, the, the splitting of characters. Uh, and this, this often happens in, in um, Green's work, and, and here it is in, in The Third Man, but it also happens all the way through um, Carol Reed's films. Reed had this reputation as being marvellous with actors, mm. um, and he was so marvellous with actors that perhaps we lose sight of this, this visual mm. eye he had too. Mm. Um, mm. I think there was something very striking about that wheel rising, and we see through the, 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 the gantry um, and, uh, and used the, the city as an extra character it was, was marvellously done. And, yeah. I mean, like, everyone sort of famously goes on, on about the, the angles. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not sure, I mean, it seems to me um, Reed was above all um, an intuitive director, and I think it was a crooked world he had to portray, so in, in a way, the, the, the angles. If you think about The Third Man, it is inconceivable to think about it without thinking of Karras' uh, zither music. On the other hand, who remembers the music of The Man Between? I think he had a sense of how to balance music and, and not music very well. It, it's actually chilling when um, the Karras theme music stops and we are up um, you know, in, in, on the big wheel at the very top and you can hear the, the, um, the, 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 the creaking of the wheel and there's no music at that point and it's deadly serious. I think we, we really need to sort of, if at all possible, say something general about, about Reed. Uh, do you have any sort of comments about his significance or his importance, uh, maybe his impact on future generations of filmmakers, not only in Britain but elsewhere? Bruce, do you want to say anything about that? The general thing, I think he is uh, you know, one of the great um, English filmmakers, even you know, the, 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 the relatively minor films have always got in very interesting things in them. And he made um, a number of you know, obvious masterpieces, The Third Man, uh, Odd Man Out, and then that wonderful um, thriller comedy, um, Night Train to Munich, that, that if people haven't seen that, that, that they, should, uh, they should see it. Um, and I, I think what we were saying early on, that, that the films of the 1930s are uh, kind of paradigms of making much out of restrictions and... With Carl Reed, he was very much part of a system and representative of a particular system of filmmaking. And one's always aware of the team. And I don't think there's anything shameful about having a team in filmmaking. <coughs> and maybe, in a way, that was Reed's genius, that he knew how to get the best out of the team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, other filmmakers um, were enormously um, respectful and... Um, uh, uh, of, of Reed's work. I mean, I, just to take one example, there's a marvellous analysis of the editing in uh, mm. Odd Man Out by one of the great British directors, Carol Rice. So that's just one example, but there are many, many other examples. Clearly, um, he was somebody who was much admired by his fellow filmmakers. And it's, I mean, in the 1930s, he was regarded as being one of the three top British directors, Alfred Hitchcock, David Lean, mm. and Carol yes. Reed.